Uh, well, uh, hello everybody. Um, thank you for bearing with us there. We had a couple of uh, technical difficulties. Um, we are live streaming, so I hope everyone out there watching in YouTube land uh, can hear us and see us. Um, we're being joined by people from all over the world, from Australia to America to Canada, um, and over the channel in Britain, so you're very welcome. And, uh, and also, thank you everyone here for coming. Um, I was sort of worried about the attendance because of being cold and icy, but you've met it, so thank you very much uh, for, 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 for uh, choosing to spend your evening with ourselves. Um, I'm David, and uh, I'm a part of the uh, Lurgan Townscape Heritage Scheme. And uh, this is our first event of the year, which we're uh, co-hosting with the Friends of Shankill uh, Graveyard Group. Um, it's going to be a very exciting year. We're restoring uh, a number of buildings in the town, um, so that work should be commencing on our first buildings in uh, the next uh, few months after years of uh, struggle to get it over the line. And as well as that, we'll be holding various events throughout the year, en encompassing genealogy, archaeology, uh, heritage building skills, and uh, lectures, and all sorts of things. So keep an eye out on our uh, website, uh, lurgantinescapeheritage.com, um, to keep up to date with all of that. Um, but this evening's talk is focusing on the topic of migration and, and its place in Lurgan history. It's a topic that uh, perhaps doesn't, is not given its rightful place when we do talk about the history, but yet it is perhaps the most dynamic component of our history. Um, our speaker tonight uh, does, however, appreciate the importance of migration, uh, both inward and outward migration in history. He's uh, Dr. Patrick Fitzgerald, or Paddy Fitzgerald, um, who has uh, spent a large part of his time uh, on a career um, research in uh, migrant history in Ireland. Uh, he's also part of the uh, Mellon uh, Mellon Centre for the Studies of Migration. Mellon Centre for Migration Studies. studies. Yeah, okay. But, but you were close. Do you know, do you know I was, was practising that at home, and, and I, knew, I, knew I, would, I knew I would skip over it, um, which specialises in a, a, the migration history of Ireland. Um, I think actually the tagline is uh, discovering the migrant in everyone. Exploring the migrant in everyone. Exploring the migrant in everyone. Um, which I think says a lot about um, the work that Paddy is involved in. So this uh, course is, or this uh, lecture is very timely because uh, next week we will be commencing uh, an online genealogy course which will help you uh, research uh, your ancestors who emigrated, whether it be to America, Canada, Australia or Britain. And I think this will, um, and that's with uh, the Ulster Historical Foundation. And I'm delighted to see that uh, Gillian is here and Fintan here is here as well. So thank you very much uh, for coming. Um, so this will be a, a lovely introduction to, to that course. I know there's a couple of people here today who will be doing that. Um, so Paddy, I might put my foot in it enough here, so I'm going I'm to pass over to you. Thank you very much. OK, I, I'm quite petite, so I just need to adjust that a little. It's great to be back in Lurgan, and uh, a delight to see uh, an audience out tonight on a night like that. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's watching from all corners of the globe. Uh, what I will refer to from here, henceforth as the Lurgan Diaspora. Um, thanks also to David for the invitation to come and speak, and it's also a pleasure that we are, in a way, trying to set a scene um, for the course that uh, David referred to, um, that no doubt Gillian and others in the Ulster Struggle Foundation will uh, proceed to take over the next four or five weeks. Uh, looking at the genealogy and the emigrant ancestor. So in a sense, what I'm trying to do tonight is set a backcloth against which that makes sense in terms of historic migration patterns. Um, when we talk about diaspora, I suppose initially we, we think we're conditioned now very much to focus on the, the concept of an Irish diaspora. And back in the early 90s, um, Somebody, some civil servant, probably on a train in Dublin, on the back of a cigarette packet, uh, came up with a figure of 77 million, as they do. Um, but roughly, that's an estimation of the scale of the global Irish diaspora, um, 77 million. And I think that's quite interesting, because if we, if, we, if we come down from that and think about what we would refer to as local diasporas and the Lurgan diaspora, what it means, roughly, is that out there around the globe today, is a population of, let's say, somewhere in the region of 250,000 people, quarter of a million people, who have a special affinity with the town of Lurgan through historic migration that originated in this town. And when you start to then think about this, what, I, what I've talked about here is what is the role going forward in the future for 
this entity called the Lurgan Diaspora? Can it feed in to things like the project that David's involved in, which is the regeneration of the main street? I was in St. Field relatively recently, and they have a, a great example where somebody whose ancestor had left St. Field in the late 18th century is now a wealthy American, they're still out there, um, who was prepared to invest, lend you know, capital to them for the development uh, in, in St. Field of a heritage park. So it's just a little example of what the potential uh, of the, the, the local diaspora uh, can actually be. But as well for ourselves, to retain that sort of consciousness, I think it's a rather arresting kind of notion of this entity that we can refer to as the Lurgan diaspora. Now, before we go into it, I just wanted to kind of present this to you to help us with the way that we think about migration. Um, the book was published uh, in 2008, and myself and the then director, uh, Brian Lampkin, uh, published this book, a kind of a survey, effectively, of four centuries. Uh, of migration in Irish history. But really to open up by saying that the definition which we use is a very simple one, which is simply moving home. That concept of that's what migration, when you boil it down, is really about, about moving home. And when we analyse migration, we can identify what is what we call the SDO3 model. Um, I don't want to get too theoretical. But essentially, in any migration, there are three stages. There's the leaving of an old world, the crossing of an intervening obstacle and arrival into a new world. Okay, That exists whether that migration is 3,000 miles or one mile. In migration, there are three directions. There's movement in, which we generally refer to as immigration, and there is movement out that we refer to as emigration, and movement within, which we generally refer to as internal migration. And then when we begin to think about the outcomes, the impacts of that migration, we can imagine it in terms of three potential outcomes. If you think of it as a kind of a, 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 a spectrum, at one end of the spectrum is a state of segregation, where a migrant arrives into that new world but is, remains utterly segregated. Perhaps you might argue fixated with the old world. At the other end of the spectrum, what we can refer to as complete integration, where rapidly and easily the migrant adjusts and integrates into that new world. But actually, in most instances, most migrants occupy a kind of middle ground, which we refer to as modulation, in between the state of, of, of extreme segregation or ex extreme integration. The other thing I wanted to do at the outset is, is to say very often these things are about connections and personal and family connections. And it seemed appropriate as you go to explore your family history that I, in a sense, bring mine into the picture. Not only because I am uh, an Armagh man, born and bred, um, but I wanted to refer to the paternal line of the Fitzgeralds, who uh, take us back to a place called the Tunney, which some of you may know on the Loch Shore, not too far away, up from Achille there and the townland of few more where the Fitzgeralds were settled uh, in the 19th century until a fire destroyed the family home, that rather nice house, uh, I believe from memory in 1927. Um, but that sense of connectedness, you know, I kind of think of their world uh, where they were as kind of oriented, orientated towards firstly Glenavy, which is only a couple of miles away, but beyond that Lisburn to the north, but also Lurgan to the south. His second wife, a man called William Fitzgerald, a JP, uh, who's my great-great-grandfather, uh, he married, his second wife was a woman called Higginson, who was from Lurgan. So it shows you just the world again that they were, they were living in. The second connector um, to Lurgan is that aged four, um, I got measles, uh, living in Armagh, and was taken for what I think was seven days, maybe ten days, in Lurgan Hospital, as photographed here. And it might seem a very trivial thing, and why am I mentioning it, but, you know, as a four-year-old, if you take yourself back, in a way, it's my first memory of leaving. I never forget sitting in the ward as my mum and dad waved at me, you know, and said goodbye, and I'm sitting there going, what's going on here? I do not like this. You know, you you're felt very uncomfortable at the idea of being left, 
uh, at that age. So I, I, I throw it into the pot. It didn't, it didn't scar me for life, but it certainly is a, is a lasting memory. I'm going to now introduce, before we get into the idea of people moving out uh, and more recent history, I want to just reflect on the idea of early human settlement, thinking about the first evidence archaeologically of the, uh, you know, settlement in this area. And I'm going to hand over to Liam for a, a particular reason here. So I, I'm kind of, uh, the, the add-on expert here, so I'm despair. Uh, but, 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 but we won't we won't discuss it. He's the, he's he's the proper heir. Uh, but to flag, I think a far more important book. Uh, sorry, my my name's Liam Campbell, and I'm a colleague of of Paris at the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies. And uh, for my, I've just been there about a year, and prior to that, I spent a very, very lovely, uh, almost six years uh, working at Loch Ness Partnership on the shores of Loch Ney. And I do want to flag up a book, and it relates to this. Uh, it's not a book selling, but uh, Fintan and, and Jelena there, we, we produced this book. It's, just, it's going to be launched in a week or so. Uh, it's an atlas of Loch Ney. It's about 50 essays about, about Loch Ney, uh, looking at the built natural and cultural heritage uh, from 50 people, local and experts from other places. And I, 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 I do commend it. And I, it was an honour, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's beautifully produced. So anyway, that's, that's my plug. I hope we sell as many as the other spare is selling. But uh, <laughs> no, what I wanted to say, I mean, without being facetious, um, the, uh, Paddy had mentioned about earliest, uh, earliest settlements and earliest movement of peoples. And I suppose the reason that I put up Loch Ney here is and Paddy has up Ahagallon, which is just across the border from, uh, from Armagh, but it's not that far from Lurgan. And I'm quite sure you'll all know uh, where Ahagallon is. And we had a dig as part of our Loch Ney landscape project there. And the reason that that's up is you tend to forget uh, how close Lurgan, Ahagallon, and all these places are to Loch Ney. Loch Ney is almost so big, we, we don't recognise it. It, it, it's, you know, it's so big that you, you kind of forget about it unless you're on the Loch Shore. But with regard to the movement of peoples, if you think about the northern uh, shore of, of Loch Ney and you think of the ban going out, the first peoples coming into this island, as, as evidence shows, although it, it could be other places, but certainly the first, one of the first major is, is at Mount Sandal, at the mouth of the ban. So if you think about it, Rivers, waters, roots, as an or OTS, uh, which you'd be looking at with Gillian, but I also think it's also important to look at or -O -U -T -E -S. I mean, One of the things we're looking at migration now increasingly, Paddy and I, is, is looking at the role of railways, looking at the role of, of movement of peoples. But why do we put up Ahagallon and all of the thing, anything to do with Loch Ney, is that uh, if you think about it, the water is a connector, not a divider. It moves people. And Danny Donnelly's, I suppose, seminal work, Loch Ness Shores, many years ago, proved that people were marrying across the loch and knew each other. So there, there are migration stories of marriage and movement of peoples. Um, uh, for example, you know, somebody from Tum may not know somebody from Mahali nowadays. But actually, in the past, people, he had proved that people were marrying because the water is a connector. And that, I think that's really, really important to think about migration and, and, and actually uh, to, think about, to think about roots. Uh, Ahagallon in particular is interesting in that uh, a henge, we're talking about Leolithic peoples going back to probably 3000 BC, possibly, no huge definitive. But one of the things we found there was medieval glass. So people are trading. There's a trade in glass and people are moving about. So I suppose, you know, the thing to really say is that it's exploring the migrant in us all. And as Paddy will say after a while, when he looks at internal migrant, it's not always about distance. Uh, because sometimes when people think of migration, they think only of emigration. 
But if somebody moves from Lurgan into Belfast, that's a migration. You know, if you move from Tamoira to a townland next, you know, three miles away, that's a migration also. Uh, Tamoira is a very interesting place where, where, where I met David at a, a, involved with a project to do with the Mud Walled House there. So I suppose it's to think about that thing that the corridors, the routes, the coming in uh, of peoples from the earliest times. And I think we forget about that at our peril when we think about migration. So don't always think about our OTS when you're working with Gillian. Think also about our OUTES. OK, I'll hand you back to Patty. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. OK. So I think it's also important to reflect back on inward migration in terms of the 17th century. Um, John and William Brownlow, who were fundamentally important, as we know in this building, um, to the story of early plantation in this particular area, Clambrazel as it was, um, take us back to particular places in England. Um, the link with the Brownlows take us um, to Basford in Nottinghamshire on the left, and Epworth in Lincolnshire. Le Epworth, interesting, it was also the place of birth of the Charles and John Wesley. Um, but it's just that idea again of that specific sense of connectedness. I don't know has anyone in this room ever visited either of those two settlements. Yeah. Oh, right, good man. Well done, George. Point, point over here. Um, because I just think it is, it is interesting when you when you go back to a place and, and you know yeah you forge and reconnect. Um, that's interesting. But the context in which the Brownlows sit, as the map uh, indicates is really within a conveyor belt, a corridor of migration across South Ulster, from Carrick Fergus on Belfast Lock, down the Lagan Valley, across North Armagh, through the Clogher Valley, and down into Fermanagh, of predominantly, but not exclusively, English settlement. So you find descriptions of 17th century Lurgan as feeling very much like an English, English town, an English settlement. And if we look forward then at the lease book that Raymond Gillespie had edited, again it confirms from the leases from 1667 on um, of that concentration in migration from that north and western part of England, those counties that fed the stream of migration uh, into this particular area. And the idea, again I, I refer to William Rosen in the foundation, of the three maps, which I think work wonderfully well in us understanding the processes that are at play in the 17th century as an interaction between the Ulster Scots, the Ulster Irish and the Ulster English. So this area, if you like, is very much an area where the Ulster English held sway in the 17th century. Um, and as a sort of a cultural marker, although it's, it's a little theoretical, it was T.G.F. Patterson, curator in the uh, in the Armagh Museum, who in an article uh, pointed to the significance of cider production in Armagh, and particularly O'Neill land in North Armagh in the early uh, 17th and into the 17th century and beyond. You know, that was a clear reference to the importance of cider production in western counties of England, Somerset, Herefordshire, etc. And that, again, even today, I think that's Carson's cider, uh, showing my true expertise here. Um, that that uh, you know, is still a marker of the production of cider in this part of the world. To try and connect and link uh, immigration with emigration, that pictured uh, on the left of the screen there is James Logan, son of Patrick Logan. Patrick Logan came from uh, Midlothian, just south of Edinburgh in Scotland, the Lowlands, um, in the early seven, 1670s. James was born here in Lurgan in 1674. And then subsequently, as a Quaker, I should have said what's interesting really about Patrick uh, Logan and the family is that although they're Quaker, they're Scots Quakers, you know, so it kind of goes against the norm, which is to associate the Quakers with England. Um, but in fact, in this instance, Logan is, is an Ulster Scots Quaker. But James Logan then accompanies um, Penn, William Penn, uh, to Pennsylvania, the nascent colony of Pennsylvania, in 1699. And as secretary to Penn is a very influential and important man in the early colonial history of Pennsylvania. 
Um, and I've just put the, the shot again of, of Quaker, the Quaker meeting house here in Lurgan, the importance of Quakerism in the complexion of Lurgan in the late uh, 17th century. But Penn, as I say, associated particularly uh, with the efforts that he went to as a key player in that colony to bring and encourage Ulster Scots across the Atlantic to settle in Pennsylvania, and particularly on the frontier uh, back country of Pennsylvania. Really, I think, thinking of them as a kind of buffer, a military sort of buffer to Native Americans. Now, as it turned out, I think he lived to regret his uh, enthusiasm for settling uh, Ulster Scots in that part of the world, because more often than not, they proved to be catalysts to friction with the Native Americans. Um, so he may well, as I say, have regretted his uh, initiative. In Pennsylvania today, where you driving um, down the uh, Interstate 76, um, you would come upon a township by the name of Lurgan. I suppose I better ask the question, anyone here been in Lurgan, Pennsylvania? Don't think so. No, you can't claim that one. Okay, we haven't got anyone on that one. But there's, there's, there's a go. That's, that's, a, that's on your to-do list. Um, so why is Lurgan there? Well, again, precisely because it is on that main belt or channel of settlement. You're about 160 miles west of Philadelphia, and you're going across south um, Pennsylvania, headed towards the opening of the Valley of Virginia, the pathway that very many of those Ulster Scots Presbyterian settlers uh, settled uh, in the course of the 18th century. The township uh, actually gained its name, I think, from memory in 1743. The reason that I've included references here as ways of reflecting the, the popular literature on this is that it really is, I'm afraid, highly distorting. Now, I've, I'm afraid picked out Billy Kennedy and Tim Pat Coogan, so I do hope I don't get sued by them through the, the video. But the point, the point really is that it, it has left us, I'm afraid, with a rather distorted legacy and understanding of migration from Ulster to America. Um, the problem, in a sense, with the works nine, I think there are in total, that Billy has produced as a journalist, are that they don't look over the precipice that we call 1800. So he's continually representing the figure, you might say stereotype, of the frontiersman, uh, you know, Ulster Scott settler in the back country and so on and so forth. The big problem with that is that the vast majority of Ulster Scots Presbyterians crossed the Atlantic long after 1800, not in the 18th century, and I'll demonstrate that point in the following slide. So in a sense, we have that stereotype of the idea that the Ulster Scot is going out to America in the 18th century, consciously looking for the cabin in the woods, looking for space on the frontier, isolation, etc., etc., a lot of recent research, not least this excellent book by Ridner, actually looks at Carlisle on the map here. And what it shows us is the diversity of the experience of these 18th century Ulster settlers. Many of them playing important roles in towns like Carlisle as urban grandees, urban, urban settlers, urban merchants, etc. So even in the 18th century, it's not a straightforward story at all. Crucial to our understanding are these dimensions, of course, of time and space. I picked out the date 1819 because I think symbolically it's important. In 1819, Belfast became linked by a daily passenger service, as did Dublin in the same year, to Liverpool. And not only did that begin herald an age in which Liverpool would be fundamentally important to the shaping of the Irish diaspora, but it actually marked also, I would argue, a transition to mass emigration. If you look below there, <clears throat> the smaller um, blocks are for the period from 1680 to 1820, when roughly about two per 1,000 of settled population left the, uh, left the province of Ulster. Okay? So emigration in that era, up to 1820, is running, on average, about two per 1,000. When you shift forward to the generation from 1820 to 1890, that accelerates to 15.5%. So, to put it simply, about 7.5 times greater the volume of 
emigration from the province of Ulster in the night, crudely in the 19th century than the 18th century. Very, very important. And that applies irrespective of your denomination. The high point of emigration by Presbyterians from Ulster is the 1840s. If we think about the space, and this is a, a bit of a bugbear, but in a way what's happened is that American historians on one side of the 49th parallel and Canadian historians north of it have tended to concentrate on their national narratives. They've told the story of immigration and settlement into those two entities. And I think in many ways that has again distorted our understanding. It's crucial, I think, that we see the joined up holistic view of the continent of North America. Um, migration uh, into North America, as again, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, is very, very important uh, in the era, particularly before the Great Famine. I just wanted to include a bit of local evidence here, A, because it's a, it's a particularly rich series of correspondence, but this gentleman, William Montgomery, um, although originally uh, from, from this area, uh, was out in Cincinnati, and he's writing back to his cousin, who's here, well, in Portadown, uh, Joe Seawright, and uh, it's September 1848 at the height of the famine. And Montgomery's, how shall we say, exercised, maybe is a good word, about the idea of having to come back because his father, who's aged and living in this area, you know, that he d he's required to come home in order to look after and sort out the affairs of his elderly father. And he, he, he writes thus, they have construed, talking of the family, they have construed some of my former letters into a wish on my part to give up all my ambitious views of future advancements and quietly return home and spend the remainder of my hitherto checkered life in quietness in Portadown, Lurgan or Tandragee. And what I think comes through from that is you know, the strong sense in which in the world that Montgomery sees in Cincinnati, downtown Cincinnati, the city represents the future. The countryside, particularly perhaps the Ulster countryside, to him represents the past. And there is this sense of dynamism and, you know, uh, you know, modernity that is associated with Cincinnati that he desperately does not want to give up and return quietly to North Armagh. Shaping the patterns of migration uh, fundamentally uh, in this time period were what the geographers refer to as chain migration. The idea of a particular locale here in Ireland being associated and connected uh, through migration to a particular space in the diaspora. That sense of you know, specific connectedness between individual locales. The painting is by a man called James Brennan, uh, Letter to America, which kind of illustrates that idea of a sister maybe making her way with a prepaid ticket out to join a brother or sister who's already established in a particular place in America. Now, in the case of um, Lurgan um, and uh, Porter Down, um, a lot of the migration of that era, uh, certainly in the late 19th century, in the 1880s, for example, uh, was directed to what was then referred to as the City of Progress, um, which was the city of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Now, I've learned this evening, breaking news, but George was also reminding me of Manchester in Connecticut, where I think later into the 20th century, a similar chain was connecting um, two places, uh, Lurgan, Portadown, and Manchester in Connecticut. But Springfield, Massachusetts was where, for example, Moses Tegart, the Bogland poet written by John Wright, the book, um, he emigrated in the 1880s to Springfield, Massachusetts, and others followed along the same chain. So again, you have that sense of chain migration and connectedness. But chains also broke. There was division and splintering, and it is also a theme in the 19th century diaspora. An example of that is this brilliant volume, three volumes in total, um, uh, of The Search for Missing Friends, which was a little column in the Boston Pilot newspaper where you could place an advertisement if you were looking for somebody who had emigrated and you had, you'd lost track of them. So in this instance, I think it's Nancy, um, yeah, Nancy or Anne, otherwise known as Anne Devlin, who had left in 1841 from the Lurgan area as a young girl, had ended up in New York City, and she is now lost. The, the, the father 
who is uh, James Devlin, now in Pittsburgh, and a brother who's in Water Street in New York. So they've placed the ad in the Boston Pilot looking for the 15-year-old uh, Anne or Nancy, trying again to reconnect and make the connection again. The final one I wanted to include here comes from our own Irish Immigration Database, and it's a death notice from the Belfast Telegraph in 1877. And it's for a man um, by the name of um, I'm trying to say, uh, Robert Watson. Robert Watson. And Robert Watson had gone out from this area um, and settled as a very, very successful merchant, trading largely in linen goods. And he settled in New York City and became one of the most prominent merchants uh, in the later 19th century in uh, downtown New York through the trade in linens. And it's just to remind us, when you're thinking about your family history, thinking about patterns of migration, bearing in mind how important fine linens and the production of fine linens were in this part of the world. I don't need to tell you that probably, but that that also had with it this diaspora of mercantile business connections out across the Atlantic and other parts of the globe. And in many ways, Robert Watson was just a sort of iconic figure of that, um, of that particular phenomenon. As I mentioned earlier, as we focus in a little on British North America, that's what BNA stands for, what later became Canada, um, it's just to point out the significance of British North America, later Canada, in, in the picture, particularly here in Ulster. Um, a strong continuing link of significance to British North America. Actually, in the period between 1815, the end of the Napoleonic War, and 1847 at the height of the Great Famine, more migrants from actually the whole of Ireland settle, or sorry, enter the continent of North America through British North American ports than through ports in the United States. Okay? It's about 55% of the influx into North America is coming in through British North American ports, primarily on the basis of affordability. It was cheaper, crudely, to get to British North America than it was the United States. But there's a very important footnote to that, which is to say that it doesn't necessarily mean that ultimately there was a greater number of migrants from Ulster in British North America than in the United States, because throughout its life, in the 19th century, British North America and Canada is actually a net emigrant country. In other words, it's losing people to the United States. So lots of migrants from the island of Ireland who land in Halifax or land in a, in, a, in a British North American or Canadian port ultimately end up in the United States. It had that magnetism, that particular draw uh, to the south. One example, um, again, courtesy of the UHF, uh, this journal, this journal was, that's what it is, it's really a diary or journal that was compiled by a man called Wilson Benson and edited a few years ago by Cecil Houston and William J. Smith. Footnote on William J. Smith of local interest, local boy done good. He is a Lurgan man, he was a historical geographer, still is, um, based at Maynooth, but his origins, he was born and raised in Lurgan. But the story of Wilson Benson is interesting, again, as an example of that draw to Canada. Um, he settles, he emigrates in 1841 from Mullantyne, a townland just to the southwest on the fringe of Portadown, and settles out in Ontario, um, like many other Protestants um, from Episcopalians from this area. Uh, they, they went out and settled in Ontario. And of course, connections such as the Orange and other associational connections like that were very important. Um, Ontario, by the end of the 19th century, had actually more Orange Halls um, than uh, Ireland. So, uh, you know, the significance of the associational framework uh, was, was definitely there. Just to set that then into a very broad framework in terms of trying to, I suppose, think about the mentality, the worldview of individuals. And I think particularly where, you know, we're thinking about the Episcopalian or Church of Ireland community, in particular, not exclusively by any means, but in particular, the world of the empire and the British empire and the networks that were spread across that empire are important in the understanding of the shaping of emigrant decisions. Thinking about church, civil service, education, military, associational, like Orangeism, <coughs> engineering, police, health, trade, a whole span 
um, of associations and networks right across um, the British Empire, those parts of the globe coloured red, which had this appeal for uh, migrants from here. And the reason that there's a photograph there of, I think, a local uh, national school now defunct um, is just to, again, emphasise the centrality of the national schools and how important they were in fueling this. You know, understanding the role of the national school very consciously as a way of educating to prepare people for emigration, almost exclusively into the English-speaking world. So the transition away from Irish into literacy and English, fundamental in underpinning the migration out into that English-speaking world. OK, let's think, uh, look, look south for a moment and think a little bit about Aust Australia. Um, now, one of the things to say is that it's one of the destinations in the world that um, has a very high, in fact, the highest um, proportion of today's Australia, of, of population uh, than anywhere else in the diaspora. About 12% of Australia's population today is made up of those of Irish extraction. But there's a significant footnote, which is that more of that migration from Ireland was drawn from a line roughly between Dublin and Galway. So in other words, from the southern half of the island, particularly uh, the province of Munster. Now, there is migration from Armagh. Within the Ulster frame, Armagh is, I think, one of the more significant, um, one of the more significant uh, counties in terms of the shaping of that. There were three areas where you can detect distinct Ulster clusters or hubs uh, in South Australia um, from the 19th century on. Firstly, um, in the rich dairying river valleys uh, just to the south, on the south coast of New South Wales, just south of Sydney. From there, you then get a secondary movement up to the northern rivers on the Gold Coast, um, close to just south of Brisbane. And then finally, in the 1850s and 60s particularly, you have a movement into the state of Victoria. And that was largely fuelled by the influence of the gold rush of the 1850s and 60s. So you've got a movement conditioned by convict transportation initially, between 1788 and 1868, about 27,000 uh, people sent out forcibly transported to the uh, Australian colony. Then in the 1850s and 60s, the major pull, the big magnet of the gold strikes, uh, particularly in the state of Victoria, gives uh, you know, a major impetus to the outflow to Australia. And then, subsequently, throughout the later part of the 19th century, the significance, perhaps a third of all the migrants who went in that time period, did so with assistance um, from the uh, Australian colonies or, or, or the government um, to go out. But I think an underlying concept, a word, short word, that is important in our minds to, to sort of frame this is thinking from a governmental point of view about bio people. You know, the importance of the population of a place like Australia. So there is a fundamental desire to actually have people, hopefully a gender mixed population, in order to sustain and develop the, the population of the colony. Just again, if you want to pursue that in terms of things that you can look at and read that would, would, would help. Um, now it's 1987, um, so it's quite a while ago, but still very, very useful um, is Trevor Parkhill's piece uh, on Australian, uh, Ulster Australian uh, emigration published in Familia um, back in 1987. David Fitzpatrick's book Oceans of Consolation is an absolute classic. Unfortunately David passed away just a few years ago but it's a wonderful, wonderful book and really in bringing together 14 series of correspondence between Ireland and um, Australia there is one local connection here which I think can throw light uh, on an understanding. Uh, this is by a man called Hammond, who was from Tamna uh, Figlassen. Sorry, I butchered that. Tamna Figlassen. Got away with it. Um, and that, you know, there's the correspondence back and forth between Australia and that part, of, this part of Armagh. Again, very enlightening. In terms of material that looks particularly at the place, you might say, space within the imperial world, um, particularly in Australia, uh, for Protestants from Ulster, uh, Lindsay Proudfoot, the historical geographer from Queens, 
uh, and Diane Hall's book of 2001 is, is excellent in, in trying to set a context for that. Moving on, as one might, um, to New Zealand. Uh, we have a collection of essays by Brad Patterson, who's based in Wellington, uh, published this back in 2006. There's no doubt that Ulster pro rata was more significant proportionately actually in the settlement of New Zealand than was the case in Australia. Um, if you look at the table there, you may or may not be able to make out that 2% of that uh, list originate in Armagh. So it looks like Armagh probably wasn't centrally important. Probably Antrim and Down dominate in terms of the origins of New Zealand uh, migrants from Ulster. One of the things that strikes you as you look at that image uh, of a farm in South Island, New Zealand, is how similar actually the topography and the landscape are to an Ulster eye. That could well be Armagh County um, or any other part of Ulster for that matter. So in a sense the people are going out are going out to a world which geographically had many, many similarities in terms of uh, you know climate as well as uh, landscape. It is true that New Zealand, again with assisted migration in play, was attractive to industrial workers, which is a point worth bearing in mind when we're thinking about Lurgan and Portadown in the late 19th century. People who were working in places like Lurgan, in the, in the linen mills and the factories, the processing plants, this destination of New Zealand was attractive. We also are conscious, just to our north, uh, okay, we're straying into Antrim, but the Balance House at Glenavy. Um, John Balance went on in 1891 to become um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand with his origins here in the Balance House in Glenavy. And again, just to blow our trumpets, he was the Premier who gave the woman the vote anywhere in the Western world first. So there we are. A blow. A cheer for John Balance. <laughs> Misogyny is all in the news. Not what what. Um, so Again, also pointing out that uh, you know, uh, assisted uh, emigration to New Zealand was a very important part of the picture. Really in the period from about 1850 through to the late 1880s, that window, probably about half of those who left Ireland to go out to uh, New Zealand did so with some governmental assistance. Now, inevitably, one has to kind of, you know, condense a little bit here. I'm not going to go through all these in enormous depth, but simply to flag them up as destinations around that diaspora. South Africa, Donald McCracken, whose origins lie uh, here in, in Ulster, um, has done a sort of wonderful one-man job out in South Africa. Again, looking at particularly the importance, the centrality of the settlement in the Cape Cape of Good Hope as the most significant place where Irish and Ulster settlers did settle. They didn't settle in huge numbers, which in some ways is, you know, you could ask why, and there's a, a multiple complex re, range of reasons. Um, but one of them that I think probably is worth mentioning is the impact of violence, you know, the, the Zulu Wars followed by the Boer War, all of that, you know, it was an important marker in terms of how the, the colony was perceived. India is a very intriguing diaspora destination, which often doesn't enter into our consciousness when we think about emigration. Um, but actually, it's really important. I mean, very important in terms of the numbers of personnel whose origins, you know, uh, began on this island. There's a, there's a wonderful woman called Eileen Hewson who has spent her lifetime putting together these wonderful collections of you know church memorials, gravestones. I see I see Gillian nodding with her. I just think she's brilliant. She's, she's and, and it's, I think awakened us a little bit more to how important the subcontinent of India. Even if people went and spent a period of time there in the civil service or teaching, or as a doctor, or as a, more, a military, and then come back, it still is important and shapes their their world. Argentina, um, about 30,000 Irish went out to Argentina in the later part of the 19th century. And I suppose it's the one that sort of bucks the trend in that it's not explicitly English speaking. But um, actually, in many ways, when you begin to look at the story, and again, Kelly, Helen Kelly had did, had did the thesis in Trinity and then pub published this book. When you look at it, you're best understood as being almost like a semi-colony 
uh, in terms of its relationship with Britain and what explains the Irish being there. It's almost within a colonial frame that we can best understand it. Interestingly, it very strongly dominated by immigration from the three W's. Most, if not you know, 95% of the immigrants who went out were from Wexford, Westmeath and Wicklow, three counties. Not so much about Armagh that I could discover. Um, the Caribbean, yeah, there was certainly significance, as Aikinson's book touched upon the island of Montserrat um, from the 17th century. Not on huge numbers, but they're there. They're definitely there, and those connections are interesting. As I sit here in this very grand, auspicious room, thinking about the Brownlows, I would hazard that you would do well to disassociate the profits of empire in places like the Caribbean, the fruits of sugar, from any landed estate anywhere in these islands. Stop there. Europe, we shouldn't forget about either. Important in the 17th century as we go back and think about the so-called wild geese and the migration streams, military, um, trade uh, and church as the three great strands to the migration. Um, this is just one little extract uh, from somebody who had looked at the um, hotel, the hospital, basically military hospital established in Paris um, in the 18th century. And this man, Nicholas Campbell, age 54, no relative, <laughs> uh, or maybe it was a relative, um, but on the 31st of October 1749, he is listed there, um, and his origins, Lurgan Clan, Clan Brizzle, as they call it there, but it's Lurgan. There he is, serving uh, in the wild geese. Obviously, um, Tother Island is significant, and in many ways, I used this map, Frank Neal produced it in a book about the Ar famine Irish, but it applies really uh, very, very helpfully to the whole you know, story of migration between the two islands. And that is that you know, very simple, straightforward, geographical connectedness between uh, the areas. You know, the, 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 the line that sort of connects Ulster in particular um, with the northwest of England and Scotland, uh, that connects Connaught through Leinster to uh, Liverpool and points out from Liverpool, and between Munster and the Severn Estuary and the southwest. Those sort of parallel, you know, channels across the Irish Sea were fundamental in shaping um, the, the, the patterns of migration. Alton Cowley published a book a um, number of years ago now, back in 2001, uh, looking at the very fundamental um, contribution that migrants from all over the island of Ireland made in terms of the infrastructural development, the building, as he says in the title of the book, of Britain. Um, you know, they were very, very important. I could have picked out any number of books, but one I think that's particularly interesting, not least in terms of his methodology, which actually does utilise in a very interesting way family history in terms of wider historical analysis, is Herson's book. He looks at the town of Stafford in the northwest of England and drills down into what I think are very helpful portraits of the migration streams at a family level. So I think it's a book you know, that will be influential in the future. Um, O'Leary's study simply reminds us again of the significance uh, of patterns in Wales, more predominantly for Munster, as I've illuminated earlier. But um, you know, nonetheless, we have now a good coverage um, across the island of Britain. Very important, um, particularly within that, is migration to what I've called Caledonia, Scotland, particularly southwest Scotland, uh, and particularly Glasgow and the area Strathclyde around Glasgow were particularly heavy concentrations. I think I'm right in saying that approximately 7% of the population of Strathclyde by the end of the 19th century was Irish, the 1901 census. Now, one of the other dynamics at work is textiles, those links I've talked about. I mean, Brenda Collins, a long time ago, looked at those links between uh, counties Monaghan and Armagh in particular as early as the 1840s across to a town or city like Dundee and the jute mills people to gain populated employ employment for Irish women who are going across to take advantage and just as a footnote to that to say how important the women are in the 1890s women in fact are the slighted majority 
of the immigrant outflow. So that's one of the features that makes Ireland really interesting, is that in, in comparison to most other European ethnicities, the women are now in a slight majority uh, at the turn of the century. The other point I wanted to make is just to say that if you look at um, what's called the Scottish Emigration Database, and you look at those lists of passengers who, like that, left Greenock on the Clyde. One of the things that you will find, and it was um, Tom Devine who, who pointed this out to me many years ago, is if you look at the surnames of those lists in the 1880s and the 1890s and the early part of the 20th century, going out to parts of the New World from Greenock, so many of them are surnames that are, are resonant of here, of Ulster. So in many ways we can see a sort of a hidden element of the Ulster diaspora buried within the Scottish diaspora. People who are in a sense given a Scottish identity, um, but in many senses are first or second generation migrants from this part of the world. Okay, edging towards a conclusion, uh, just wanted to say something, as Liam alluded to earlier, about logistics. Now, there's a huge amount one could say about this. It could be a separate lecture, but... Um, Really to point out, first of all, how important the railways are from the foundation of the line in 1841, Lurgan is networked into not only an all-Ireland um, network of, of railway, but you know it, it, that in itself is then connected to sea passages. Just to give an example, again, later on here, we'll mention um, the Allen line through Derry, that you got to Derry on, a, on through the railway. Um, also the connectedness in this part of the world to um, Carlingford. That's a poster from 1847, fateful year, um, from Warren Point, Carlingford, um, and to St John, New Brunswick. So just the sense again of connectedness between North Armagh and South Down, Newry, and Warren Point were very much on the horizon. But the opening up, as I say, of the, of the rail network really helps co concentrate migration on the port of Derry. And here, as I said, you are referred to those who would be agents in this part of the world if you wanted to book a passage on, sorry, I said the Allen line, I meant the Anchor line, out of Derry um, to North America. And you would have gone to, in Portadown, David Livingston and John Walker, and here in Lurgan, you'd have made your way to a man called Mr. William Emerson. And that's where you would have got your ticket to take you uh, to the New World. Okay, another possible lecture all on its own, but compressed into one slide. It's simply to say, don't obviously, as Liam said at the beginning, don't forget about the internal migration. Uh, it's not about distance. When you stop and think about migration, it doesn't actually matter if you're moving one mile or a thousand miles, in the sense of the psychology. And I don't need to tell an audience that live in Ulster that moving from, let's just say, Moy Gashel to Moy isn't a big leap in terms of distance, but it might be in terms of psychology. Okay? Now, what I wanted to say here with this wonderful graph that you probably can't see is not to forget the absolutely extraordinary thing about Ulster in the 18th and 19th century isn't its emigration. You might think it's very odd that I would say such a thing, but I'm telling you the truth while well, I'm trying to. Um, what I mean by that is obviously migration is a part of something else bigger, and that is population. And the story of the demography of Ulster is extraordinary in the 18th and 19th century. From the 1740s to the 1830s, Places like North Armagh, where we are right now, literally experience a population explosion. There isn't another word. The levels of demographic growth in the later 18th century, where we are now here, are unrivaled on the continent of Europe. Okay, So we, we really do need to understand the kind of dynamic that is involved, so that in 1841 in the census, County Armagh, is the most populated, densely populated county on the island. 541 people per square mile. That's an extraordinary... And those are the kind of statistics we see today in the southeast of Asia. Those are really, really densely populated. And you see subdivision, 
and you, you know, all that goes with that. And then the transition to a regime of relentless uh, population reduction from the height of the famine on throughout the second half of the 19th century. So all of that really is remarkable. I just wanted to flag up a couple of things that can help us in terms of reading around. Uh, Marilyn Cohen's book on the uh, uh, Tully Lish and the Linen community are very helpful. If you have linen in your family, and if you live here, there's a fair chance you might, then that is a book that I would recommend to you because she actually, like not all authors are as good as this, but she does think, you can see her thinking about the importance of migration. Now, also a man, a local historian here, um, who I met way, way, way back uh, in the early 90s, um, at the time when we were all you know, fixated with the, the salmon, Frank McCurry. And, you know, I don't know, I'm almost scared to ask about Frank these days, but that book by Frank, based on his PhD, is a wonderful piece of local history. And again, a lot of information on the subject of migration uh, contained in that work. Final thing just is thinking about Belfast. You know, the, again, remarkable story of Belfast's expansion in the second half of the 19th century, but particularly in the 1880s and the 1890s. Again, nowhere in Europe, no urban space in Europe is accelerating in population terms as quickly as Belfast in the 1890s. It is, again, just mushrooming. Overtakes Dublin um, in the census of 1901, larger population for the first time. But what's interesting about that is that the population is coming into Belfast increasingly from about 1870s, mid-1870s on, is drawn on a relatively constricted hinterland, a more Protestant hinterland, of South Antrim and North Down, rather than that wider Ulster hinterland. In other words, in a way, you could say Catholics from places like Lurgan or the Glens of Antrim or whatever, are not seeing Belfast as a particularly attractive employment option. Okay, I just wanted to finish um, on, on, on a book um, which seems to me to sort of bear down. I don't know if anybody has looked at this book by Patricia uh, Craig, Twisted Root, um, subtitled Ancestral Entanglements in Ireland. But Patricia Craig's book of 2013, which we, myself and Liam, did a, a reading club on in, in Oma, uh, now it was about four or five months ago, um, but it, it's a really interesting book, again, about mong mongrelism, if you like, about the story of her own families and how they cross from extreme loyalists on one hand to Republicans, Catholics, Protestants. You know, you get all of this entanglement. It's a good word. But the interesting thing, and the reason I mention it here tonight, apart from its general relevance to, to all of us, is that a lot of what goes on here is in Lurgan. Lurgan and the tippings. Um, you've got a photograph here of Harry Tipping, I think it is, in Edward Street in his greengrocer's shop. A lot of that goes on in this particular space. And, you know, I just think it, it would be something, if you're getting involved in doing family history, it's always interesting, I think, to have a little bit of, you know, something else on the go to sort of it's relevant but not exactly the same. It would colour the picture that you may uh, reveal as you undertake the genealogy. So thank you very much indeed for your time. And I'm, as was famously said, happy to take questions as long as they're easy ones. <laughs> Parker always used to say that. So do we wanna, I think what we might do is if Liam, do you want to kind of um, intercede, <laughs> if that's the right word? <laughs> Intercede's a good word. Uh, another word that Patty and I had earlier was uh, resonance. So I, I suppose one of the things to say, is there, is there anything in that resonates with people? Is there anything surprises you? Uh, I, I, think, I think this is a good, uh, what Patty has done is set the notion of patterns. You know, and it's a great marriage with Ulster Historical Foundation and moving into genealogy. I think, you know, to look at patterns of migration and then you can whittle it down to families and genealogies. I think it's, it's a good way to start and, and I, 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 I applaud David for, 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 for that sort of idea. But, I mean, is there anything, you know, that wants to direct to Patty ourselves about, you know, what resonated with you about that tonight? Is there a, 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 any thoughts on it? I have a few thoughts, but, I mean, th this is open to you to to say, you know, is there something there jumped out at you?
you know, big social phenomena like demography are a backcloth to understand psychology. If you want to try to empathise and understand the world and the people who are living in that world, it's very helpful to understand as kind of an energy. Um, you know, I mean, I think it was John Gray years ago, there was a, a documentary being made about Belfast in the 1890s, you know, and he, he compared it to being like a gold rush town. This is Belfast, you know, in the 1890s. Just that sense of all of the energy and excitement that come when very large numbers of young people come into a, a, an urban space. It kind of creates that, that vibe, that energy. And I think you can say that too about Lurgan. I mean, remembering that there are people moving in from the countryside into the town. And even the countryside itself, I mean, the famine undoubtedly made a huge difference in terms of how if you closed your eyes in the countryside in North Armagh, um, you know, uh, in, in the 1850s, the world would have sounded, the soundscape would have sounded very different in the sense of it wouldn't have had that energy that, you know, the population that was there, you know, pre-famine before 1845 and suddenly the massive disappearance of, you know, close to two million people from the island, you know, a massive, um, you know, hemorrhage. And the effects that that has are, are, you know, very palpable. But I do think it's interesting. I mean, it, it, it struck me, you know, for many years, I kind of hadn't really fully taken on board the impact of that massive demographic growth. And even if you go, dare I say, I'm not having a crack here at the National Museums, but if you go to the, the Ulster History Gallery in the Ulster Museum, you know, it's not really strongly enough reflected, I would argue, you do, to see that, you know, that that is a really fundamental characteristic of the society you know that we're trying to understand in the 18th and into the early 19th century of incredible population growth and subdivision in places like North Armagh you know very small plots of land focus on the production of linen cloth rather than agriculture as such yes I mean what it, 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 it's a number, of, a number of things which is again I, you know how many people really think I suppose about that big, big concept. It's a hard thing to break down, you know, the Irish diaspora. Whenever it came into our uh, rubric back in the early 90s, um, I think a lot of people did, you know, the diaspora of 77 million or 90 million, somewhere in that, in that you know, ballpark. It's a very difficult thing, actually, to get your head around, you know, to conceptualise. And I, in a way, I, I think it, it, it helps, I hope it helps, when we try to talk then in terms of a, of a local diaspora. So rather than thinking about something as massive as that, if you can think about your space, your home place, and then think about just that, you know, the outflow from there, and the, the potential for an existing, you know, re-relationship, if you like, revival of a relationship with that phenomenon today, I find that quite sort of exciting about the potential to make reconnections with people and to sustain that yeah. and that it has a role that we don't rule it out in terms of thinking about the, the concept of regeneration yeah. and as the technology has moved on and we're all skyping and zooming and you know that we can forge reconnections of real value to the home place here through an acknowledgement of the interest of the diaspora yeah. at a localized level there is a role for it I, I, I mean, I, just to add to that, Paddy, it I, I, I res really resonates with me, to use that word. Uh, our second oldest girl, Judith, she's a nurse in Belfast, but she actually plays Gaelic football. And she went to New York there after Christmas, her first time ever on the American continent. And the, the, the thing that she kept saying, she had two friends there. They're there for, for, for a year or two working. And was she was amazed at the network of the GAA that was actually in New York uh, that she just couldn't believe. So she said there were, there were more people from Tyrone there that she met, you know, with the connection that she did at home. <laughs> and, and then she met generations going back. And I was thinking what Patty said earlier, you know, about, you know, empire, how the kind of, the patterns remain the same, but maybe the networks change. You know, in a sense, empire is slightly, I suppose, past. I mean, I, I had uncles in the Merchant Navy and in the REC and, you know, went abroad and kind of things like that and, and were involved in police. That, you know, that network has changed from my, my own twisted route. But here, here's my daughter saying it was incredible. She, she just couldn't believe it in New York. She said, you know, she said, I thought, we come from a town like Colaha Brack. She said, I thought, 
you know, everybody knew where Ahabrak was. I, I, I hesitate that most people here wouldn't know where it is, but uh, so, so I, no, I, think that's, I think that's a very important thing about diaspora. Sometimes it can be so big that you're better to, you know, to locate it in a place and, 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 and at roots because it's, it, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the micro, but uh, no, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, I, I maybe just pick up on that comment actually to, to keep, it, keep it going, but... Um, in a way, you're right. I think in terms of if you're, if you're trying to sort of think, because one thing I didn't really have that much space to, to get into in this talk is about motivation, you know, explaining migration. The old classic model of push factors and pull factors, you know, it only takes you so far. But the general comment that over the years I would make talking to people who've come into the centre, who visited the folk park, particularly they're from overseas and starting a journey of interest with genealogy, is that they can think about their emigration, and they generally do in terms of what we might call the macro factors. So they, they will ask me a question like, my you know, ancestors left here in 1817, was there a particular reason? And you can say to them, yes, there was a period of economic stress, there was a downturn, a depression. You know. But you also, what I always try and stress to them is that they want to try to understand the world as best they can from the perspective of the individual, that you may see factors that are close to them within their family, within their townland, that actually were every bit as influential as a national or international economic recession. It's actually very often to do with family relations, very often to do with inheritance, you know, that inner, closer, personal world that's very important, if you can get a view of it uh, to help explain the, the texture of the decision to migrate, which is often not just one thing. You know, more often than not, if I say to you, why did you move house last? You're not going to say, well, just, you know, it might be, but more often than not, it's complex and it's, it's varied ab about why you make a decision to move from A to B. And the other thing I, I would add to that is that um, one of the things that has really interested me since looking at the, the immigrant database of letters so, in a sense, it doesn't matter if the letter is written in the 1800s or it's written in, or if somebody sends an email in 2023. You know, the emotions don't change. Uh, we were involved lately in a project with uh, uh, Prony uh, and involved in, uh, some modern migrants or recent migrants there, and they looked at the historical uh, uh, letters. They picked out letters. So the, the, because the database is word searchable, you could pick out funeral, you could pick out wedding, uh, or you could pick out, you know, seasickness or something. But, you know, ultimately, I suppose, what I have learned in the past year is that about anything of patterns of migrations, as Patty says, the macro or the micro, is that, you know, human emotions don't change. Okay, it might be easier to go to America now, and you might be able to return, but actually, you know, somebody... You know, leaving home. I, I, I had a daughter, oldest girl, left home last year, went to London, you know. And, and, you know, for her, it was a leaving, it was a loss. Yes, she can come back. But, you know, that's a loss, no less, that's it's felt as, 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 uh, as, as strong as, as anybody else. You know, home, as Paddy always says, home is central. Leaving home, you know, making a new home, all those things, looking forward, looking back. You know, ultimately, it doesn't really change. Sure, it doesn't, whether it's the 1700s or, or the 1800s. And, and we found that really enlightening with the group of people we worked with up at Prony. You know, they were writing letters. And, you know, they're reading a letter from the 1800s and saying, this letter resonates with me. Not, not about the historical facts, but about the emotion. You know, love, loss. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I'd taken down various things that Patty says, familiarity. Reconnection, that's, that doesn't change, sure, it doesn't really, you know. Um, any, anything else? Or? Um, yeah, it's a good, a, good, a good point, a good question um, to do with, again, you know, the role of, of uh, overseas destinations competing, as it were, for bio again in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there was discrimination. Uh, you know, in terms of the, 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 particularly when you look at assisted migration to the empire, the you know, colonies within the empire, there, there was a clear sense of which assistance was directed towards a kind of idealised, or at least a preferential model 
of what was best suited to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Canada, whatever. Um, so yes, there was, um, you know, if you look, for example, at the promotion of migration to the Canadian provinces, remembering that it wasn't the state of Canada that is paying for the inducement of migrants from here. If you went out to a hall like this in 1890, there would have been a, 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 an agent at the front representing an individual Canadian province. They're all in competition with each other to attract you, doing their lantern slideshows um, to attract you to go to their place. Um, but they, 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 they did, you know, have, have clear ideas in their head about what they wanted. And, you know, what was suitable for domestic service, what would have suited as a lumberjack, you know, who, what type of person do we want to bring to, to, to this country? I mean, yes, absolutely they had. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the tricky part about that, again, is back to the crucial thing of time. You know, that we are trying to be as specific as we can be about time. You know, at what moment in time was this migration happening? Because it varied a tremendous amount. Uh, whether you emigrated in 1750 or 1850 or 1920 does obviously, in terms of the technology, the logistics, the systems of migration, make a huge difference. As indeed do the context into which people move. So, for example... You know, migration, I will get back to the question, but, you know, if you, if you look at migration in the, in the contemporary world where there are welfare states and systems, you know, that, that world is a different world in important qualitative ways from the world of the 17th and 18th centuries, just to make a, you know, kind of obvious point. So in terms of, you know, trying to explain, the one thing I would say, because it's, it's, it is very difficult to answer it, two, two points, I'll, I'll, I'll try and remember what they are. <laughs> one is to say, when you ask how much does it cost to go from um, Belfast to New York, it's a bit like, you know, in, in the mid-19th century, it wasn't that different from us going up to Aldergrove tonight and saying, how much will it cost me to get from here to London? You'll get a number of different answers depending on the the airline carrier is going to carry you. And it was similar again, so there's a competitive environment in terms of what it's going to cost. Um, what was the, I see I knew you'd forget the other point, I'm, I'm getting old. Um, but I, I think it is, you know, you're right, you're right to say in a way, yeah. you know, that we should, we should acknowledge yeah. the bravery and the yeah. courage that's required. Because almost always, not always, but almost always within migration, there is an element of trauma in the memory. Of Trump, obviously, in terms of the Great Famine and the memory associated with that collectively, a, a sort of communal memory. But each individual who migrates, as I said in my hospital bed when I was four, at that moment of parting, there was an element of trauma. You know, yes. I've remembered yeah. that for a reason. I was not a happy bunny um, whenever my mum and dad were leaving that ward, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, you know, what's going on? So, migration does very often contain an element of psychological trauma. I mean, just to answer one of the things I learned from Paddy is that, you know, we, you talked about the model about leaving, crossing and arriving, you know, no matter what distance you go. And, and, and the thing that's not often discussed very much is the crossing. You know, whether it's, whether it's the route that you get to Belfast or it's the journey of, of the, uh, uh, across the Atlantic or wherever. Uh, one thing that I've learned, and I, I, again, uh, Paddy told me about this, so if you visit the Ulster American Folk Park, you know about the ship, you know, the old world and the new world, and, you know, this brig is supposed to represent, and, you know, everybody thinks about cramped conditions, and you think about, you know, there's, there's a stereotype of that, you know, when you're, you're on, you know, and you really work down into that, you're, you know, you're not seeing daylight and you're cramped. There's one thing that Paddy told me about and I hadn't thought about. So Thomas Mellon goes, and Thomas Mellon, it's 12 weeks journey. That's, it's 12 weeks at sea. But you know one of the things that we never think about? Boredom. You know, we think about dark, we think about food, we think about disease. So, so I suppose, to answer your question, it, it, it's always complex. You know, and that could be even you know, getting planes today and how long does it get to Australia and, you know, going between places. So I, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's important to think about the actual journey itself and the complexity of that and how much it costs and all of that. But 
you know, what there's, there's, I think, a kind of a thing too where, and we find this actually, although the, the Brig Union, the reconstructed Brig Union of 1817 that took Mellon's earlier than Thomas Mellon to America, which is the reconstructed ship in the folk park, you know, whenever somebody walks into that ship gallery and sees that, there's a kind of a trigger, I think, in their mind, which is coffin ship. And it's a very natural kind of connector that we have in our heads. That's what we make that association, the horrors of Black 47 and the coffin ship. But actually what you're looking at there is something quite different. So outside the context of 1847, you know, actually the crossing of the, of the, crossing of the Atlantic, it was probably on average a death rate of somewhere in the region of 2%. Whereas it climbed up to between 10 and 15 percent on certain vessels in 1847, but the effect of that it's getting us back to memory and trauma and how that all works. But I think people have that association when we in Ireland see a 19th century sailing ship, be it the Jeannie Johnson or you know or the Dub Brody. We we that's what we think. We th- we tend to accentuate the horror of that occasion and the possibility of death. Whereas what Liam you know is saying is that. A lot of the diaries and journals of, that people actually kept often do talk about boredom. You know, you imagine being in, in an enclosed, dark, damp space for three months. <laughs> you know, Mellon's was an, an exceptionally long crossing of the Atlantic. But, st- you know, for somebody who lived largely outdoors in the early 19th century, to be in a context like that, you, you, you kind of... It, it, it is about the passage of time. You know, it's not to utterly downplay, you know, the, 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 the unpleasantness of many aspects of it, but it is to just put it into context, again, to try to contextualise it. And the other thing, just, just uh, thinking about that, the thing that's fascinated me lately is about what I'd call rituals to do with migration. Uh, whether they're they're very old, and I think it's something that it's worthy of of study. And I'd be interested to know anything about here what people know. Uh, I'll give you an example. So a classic one is at when ships are leaving Derry, fires were lit at any shown head, you know, so that the last point that you see. I mean, you heard about you know the lighthouses are the tear of Ireland. You know, the last place you see. So th- th- that's very strong that that bonfire. But but we've learned a few things lately. Um, one is a lady approached us from near Glen Shane, where there was a cairn and you know a mound of stones and very often associated with holy wells and putting stones on. But actually what it was when people were leaving to go where like you know to head to Derry, they put a stone. And when we were at Loch Ney, if any of you know Arbo, um, uh, the, the, the high cross at Arbo, there was a tree there called a pin tree that people went and hammered a coin into the tree before they left. And we've, we've heard other things. I mean, there's people taking stones from the walls of Derry. Walking the boundary of a farm. Walking the boundary of a farm is something we found lately. Uh, and as I say, even my own daughter, she wanted to go to a beach in Donegal before she left. And, and I knew, you know, she didn't say, it, but it was a place meant a lot to her. And she wanted one last walk on the beach. Okay, she can come back again. You know, she wasn't going to Australia or for, for the rest of her life. But so, so there's little things, I think, you know, patterns, would you say, about the journeys that... And, and really, I suppose that's what we're kind of doing tonight is to set that. And, and you, know, you, you know, you begin to look at, at getting into the micro and, 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 and the families and, 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 and that, uh, yeah, so... But the other thing is about the genealogy and sort of, I suppose, the twisted route is... I mean, I don't know whether Gillian and Finn would agree with this, but almost a lot of the genealogies, people who embark on genealogy in their family history, you know, after a period of time, they'll, they'll often say, you know, when I'm talking to them, it's, a, it's not what I expected. <laughs> you know, the, so often that journey of starting to explore, it happened to me, you know. Actually, I realised in 2004, I haven't done this. And we were doing a module that we were, I was teaching, so I had to do it. And my dad had just died, so I had papers to go through and stuff like that. And, and doing that, you find out stuff, and everyone says, again, another repeated line, no doubt, is, if only I'd asked. You know, yeah. you know was yeah. that, why didn't I ask yeah. that? Yeah. Or why yeah. didn't I inquire about that? You know, that's the nature of the post-death, you know, of adjustment and thinking about this. And why did that happen? Or why did they leave there at that moment in time? Why did they, you know, there's loads of stuff like this that kind of haunts you almost. And as you look back at your family history, you find that, you know, kind of, 
heterogeneity, that, that mixture, that surprise stuff that was, was not what you thought. Yeah. And I suppose that's really, in a way, what took Patricia Craig to pick up her, uh, you know, to get on the <laughs> keyboard and, 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 and produce a book that kind of reflected on at least one dimension of that, which is the, the strange patterns that actually most of our families have left as we've passed through this particular space. Yeah, and, and, and Brian Lampkin used to say, uh, and, I, and I love this because it helped me, and he said, slightly uh, but a facetious, but he said, if you're not sleeping in the bed you're born in, you're a migrant. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you dig it down, actually, it's very true. Very few of us, I could guarantee, I don't think anybody in this room is sleeping in the bed if you're you born in, you know. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. I would doubt. Is anybody sleeping? Tell me if you are. <laughs> you may have gone back to it, but anyway. That's the MCMS test. That, 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 that's, that's our kind of strap line. Sorry, this lady, where you are. Yeah, a lot longer. Sort of a pro, I, I, about six months was probably more, more, more like yeah. it rather than you know the twelve weeks. Um, there is, there is now. I mean, one good thing again to say is the last decade, maybe decade and a half, has seen a major expansion of the literature in terms of Irish New Zealand. Must be at least sort of a dozen books have been published in that time span. So we know a lot more. Um, there are diaries and journals and collections of diary and, and journals to the whole of um, Australasia, you know, in terms of the long, the long voyage. But, you know, funny enough, again, and I, I, you know, I'm not that well read, to be brutally honest, on that. But when, when, I, when I have read material on it, I suppose one of the things that strikes me is that they actually maybe, particularly in, 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 the, in the later 19th century, in the age of steam, that in many ways they, they, they could enjoy. In other words, the, 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 the journey became almost a leisure experience as opposed to the, the, the kind of ordeal yeah. that it had been maybe in the 1840s under sail. You know, that you actually create, and you can certainly see it with the transatlantic uh, passage, but you can find it, I think, with Australia, New Zealand, and other parts of the world, mm. where travel by steam, particularly because it was so competitive <coughs> amongst different companies, actually becomes something, I mean, for example, I know I'm back on the Atlantic again, but, you know, passengers on the big, you know, White Star liners who were on the Atlantic for seven days said that was maybe the best food they'd ever eaten in their lives. A steerage, you know, that was third class. I mean, first class. I have actually cooked the 12 course meal that was, was uh, served on the Titanic. Did get it all done, I'm afraid. I think we, we backed out after about seven courses. <laughs> Probably not sober enough to cook the other three, <laughs> but anyway, it was quite. But I don't want to, I don't want yeah, to be facetious. Yeah, you yeah. know that that is just again thinking about yes. You know, it's there's boredom and the, but you know, by, it became progressively more and marketed increasingly. Travel, I think yeah. again as a leisure pursuit. The 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 in, in generality that the government was more directly involved in the regulation of the um, transoceanic other than the transatlantic, so in broad measure, yes, I'd agree with your statement. But just also to say, because I was thinking about that, you know, the point you were making is that I, I do have a strong sense in which that period of time across oceans was one in which the migrants' kind of consciousness was heightened. You know, people remembered things, they established relationships. I mean, you know the story that's oft repeated of, oh, we met on the boat, we got married, you know. And, and, but it did happen, and it, it also, lifelong friendships are forged very often in, in oh, no, those, yeah, in those yeah, vessels, journey, yeah. across the Atlantic, but also across true. the other oceans. So in a way, I do think in a way, it's a time that people look back on as a kind of defining moment in their life, is, is, is crossing an ocean, yeah. um, because it is such a statement about... A milestone, a marker in, in their life. But I, I think I think that's a very good point. Both of you make. I I think. I mean, coming to this relatively recently, but I think the thing we haven't done enough work on on the crossing. You know yeah. that that element of it. I, I think generally, mm -hmm. from what I what I've I've seen, uh, is, is that we haven't done that. Uh, I, two things that and this this relates to another point I was going to make is that lately. Uh, we do a course, William Rolston and I were involved in a course in Ahabrak, where I come from. I'm not allowed to mention it, I mention it too often, Ahabrak. Uh, it's a great townland, so it is. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, we, we used to have a festival called the Crack in the Brack, but anyway, it's, it's gone. But, but uh, we had this course, two people came to it. One was a friend of mine who was a Queensman called Leslie Craig, and he brought a box, I mean, Paddy's seen it the last day, it's a box of, uh, with the monograph, of the, re the White Star Line of letters from a granduncle of his who had written from, uh, on the White Star boat about the journey, 1913, to Canada. And it's phenomenal because he talks about seasickness and, and, and all of that. So that was in, literally in his attic. We had another lady, a retired school teacher, a Geraldine Conwell, who again, it was her great granduncle, if she found a letter uh, in the 1870s, and he talks about going to America, and he said he had no job, he had nothing to go to, and he met a guy on the boat, they forged a friendship, that friendship led to him going to a different place that he didn't intend to. So I suppose, two points to make, and one is that we tend to forget about the journey, but secondly, goodness knows in your own attics, you know, in your own families, what people have. I mean, that, that's a small town land, and you know, that's sort of gold dust we got. We can't really deal with it, we have to sort of probably pass it on to Prony, you know, and, and speak to Prony about it, and Prony are, 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 are excellent partners. But you know, it, it, you know I, 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 I think, it's a bit like what he called that treasure or that thing, uh, the, you, know, you know, the thing that Fiona Bruce does, you know, Antiques Roadshow. Road but, you know, I mean, in terms of correspondence, I still think there's a huge amount of it out there, you know, but anyway. You know, there have been, and um, your sort of idea of, I suppose, loosely framing that as, as refugees, you know, um, that there is this sort of continuity through time. Um, I mean, again, what's interesting would look, to look back at the Huguenot uh, episode in particular and looking at, again, how government and state shaped that and responded to it. And the, how, in a way, today, and in many ways, we tend to think about the migrant coming in as a problem. You know, that the language, a lot of the language revolves around the problematic nature of it rather than thinking about the potential, the positive potential, particularly in an economic context. Um, so I think it, al it always pays, it, it, it's helpful, and of course historians would say this, for us to look back and consider you know, how people like the Huguenots, French Protestants, were brought in to Ulster, um, you know, and through our, the whole of Ireland uh, in the late 17th century, and, and how those adjustments were made and how they fed into the development. When we think about Lurgan, as I've said a number, you know, we think about linen. This is, you know, this is your iconic product. Well, you know, the Huguenots were not, you know, there were others involved, but the Huguenots were very important in the stimulation of the weaving of fine linen. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a, we need to see how that can be used in a very positive way. You know, that, that I think is the message that we take out of it, is to look at historic uh, adjustments in terms of refugees and the positives that can be, can be uh, brought for, from it, rather than necessarily thinking about the problems. But there hasn't been much work done on because on, on, it strikes me that it's, yeah. it would be a... There, is, no, there, is, there has been work done um, you know, on the specifics of the continuities between the past and the present around the idea of asylum seeking and the idea of refugee shit. There, there is a literature, um, but there could, like a lot of things, there could always be more. Okay, okay well, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, well, thank you very much, uh, Pat, Patty and Liam, uh, for, for coming down. And uh, you'll find them hanging out at the uh, Ulster American Folk Park if uh, you want to come, go down and visit them. Um, no, very good. I suppose one of the things I'll take from that is, you know, uh, the idea of migration can be just over the road there. You know, it's uh, qu quite a powerful idea when you put it like that, uh, so it is. So thank you very much. And that sets up our, our genealogy course very well, which uh, commences next uh, Wednesday at uh, half seven. It'll be a completely online course. Um, if you're interested in uh, joining and you haven't joined already, you can uh, just drop me an email or um, you can come, come to me at the end here and uh, we'll get you signed up. It's over five weeks and we have an expert from uh, uh, America, Canada, Australia, and Britain, and Britain as well, sorry I forgot about Britain, 
you know, um, who'll be uh, providing us a wee bit of insight on how you go about researching your ancestors who may have emigrated there. And then we'll be, that'll be completed. Uh, our last session will be Gillian and uh, Finton from the Ulster Historical Foundation who'll be giving us an insight into uh, sources uh, to research your emigrant ancestors. Um, so yes, uh, do, do sign up if you haven't already. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm meant to say, but I don't think there is. I think that's everything. Just uh, when you're going outside, watch the ice. Um, it is very slippy, so I nearly slipped myself. That's why I was at the entrance warning you all. So thank you very much, and uh, stay at home. Good afternoon.